For Kruma Media's Polity, I'm Sashni Mudli. Joining me today are Jesse and Jaron Clegg, sons of renowned South African musician Johnny Clegg, here to discuss his memoir, Scattling of Africa. So, Jaron, Johnny Clegg was six months old when he left England for what was then Rhodesia. He was effectively kidnapped by his mother's father. Can you briefly tell us about the part of his history, you know, having a Jewish mother and a Christian father? Yeah, so he, he was effectively kidnapped uh, at a very young age because, you know, Harry wanted to maintain his Jewish heritage with the idea that he would grow up and he would be bar mitzvahed and uh, that Christianity wouldn't come into it at all. So, and in fact, it, it, it didn't really at all in his life um, because he never, he never got to see his biological dad until he was 21, really, uh, to really meet him. So yeah, his Jewish heritage was pretty much the only thing he had in his life until he discovered you know, Zulu culture and other things. And it's, it's kind of ironic because he, <laughs> he, uh, he, yeah, he, he ended up making friends with Charlie and Zila and he went on this huge cultural journey and he, he ended up not even getting bar mitzvah. He kind of rejected it and he just went all into self-discovery and connecting with, with uh, the Zulu culture. Jesse, your dad writes about joining the Zulu migrant worker culture um, and he says that it wasn't a personal statement against apartheid. What fascinated him about the migrant culture? Well, I think, you know, related to the previous question, like if you read um, about his early childhood, you see that it was very unconventional and it was quite chaotic. And he, he had these liminal father figures that kind of arrived and then left in his life. And some of them were, some of them let him down. Some of, you know, he, he and, and his mom also had a lot of her own personal challenges. And I think that there was a, there was a gap in his um, childhood in terms of what his experiences were and what his influences were. And it, it gave him this incredible desire to find friendships and find a way to understand the world and a way to um, deal with his own problems and his own internal struggles, you know. And I think, so in some interesting, strange way, you know, he, the, the chaotic nature of his childhood, I think, gave him a sense that there was something else out there and he was very curious about it. And when he discovered Zulu culture and when, well, when he first met Charlie and, uh, and then Sipo, he was very young, you know, he had no connection to the political nature of this interaction. You know, for, the, for him it was just, he was a 14 year old boy and here's another boy who was playing beautiful guitar and he was learning guitar and he was just, you know, the music is what attracted him initially and there was, there was no sense of like, this is a political statement or we're active, it was nothing like that, it was really just these beautiful deep friendships and this connection over Zulu guitar music and this newfound capacity for self-expression. Um, ultimately, politics found him later because he fell in love with this music and he, and he made these lifelong friendships and it became so ingrained and important to who he was that he ultimately had to deal with the reality on the ground. But initially it was really this beautiful, innocent, um, curious, engagement between two boys who just loved Zulu guitar music. One of the big influences in Johnny's life was his stepfather, Dan. Jaron, just talk to us a little about their relationship during Johnny's preteen and teen years. Sure. So Dan, Dan came into his life quite early in his life, just before his teens, and he was quite a magical figure. He was a man that really charged my dad with curiosity he kind of would take him on some really strange journeys and adventures. He was a journalist. So he, he himself, uh, Dan, was very curious about the world and, and always wanted to kind of dive deeper. And, and um, so he, he was someone who was uh, pivotal in kind of giving my dad this idea that, you know, there were doorways that you could go into to find out more about different avenues of culture and uh, I mean, there's, there's qu quite an amazing story that comes to mind is, you know, he, he took my dad UFO hunting <laughs> at, a, at, a, at a young age, like in the, in the, on, the, on the outskirts of Pretoria, like going, uh, going on this wild uh, UFO hunting uh, journey. And that's something that, you know, as a kid, you're like, what is this? Like, what, what, what world are we living in? And so it certainly it gave my dad, he, as he, he gave my dad this uh, a paternal kind of, father figure um, and it also he also gave my dad the the questions to you know to pose uh, on the world and 
also taught him karate and, and gave him the beginnings of what were these kind of very masculine values that my dad further journeyed into in Zulu culture. So he was, he, he was, a, he was a very important father figure who ultimately kind of disappeared and left a, quite a major void in my dad's life. You know, and that's something that also charged my dad to search for something more. And it was all part of this, like this, this, this journey of, of stumbling uh, into the Zulu culture. Another influence, and you mentioned him earlier, Jesse, was Charlie Mzila. And he introduced your dad to Zulu music and Zulu war dancing. Um, and this in turn influenced his identity. Just talk to us a bit about that. Um, yeah, Charlie was uh, the first uh, real rural Zulu that my dad met who had a, uh, a really deep understanding of Zulu culture. He was a traditional Zulu and he initially was his guitar teacher. My dad bumped into him at a, outside a cafe and heard him playing this beautiful Maskanda Zulu guitar and asked him to teach him. And from that point onwards, he would go to uh, his staff quarters in an apartment building. He was a cleaner there, and my dad would learn guitar from him. And over the years, this grew into a really deep friendship, uh, ultimately a lifelong friendship. Charlie still lives with us. He's, he's in his 70s now, and he's, uh, he's, he's like family to us. Um, and Charlie's brother is actually the one who introduced my dad to Sipo. And my dad became close to his family and he also introduced him to the dance and the symbolism and the philosophical grounding of traditional Zulu culture at a very early age. And I think that he was like really the first Zulu who was incredibly generous and had a sense of my dad's honesty and curiosity and that this was a genuine love, that it wasn't someone who was just you know, a tourist in this culture. This is someone who actually had a very deep connection. And it, you know, it's, it's such an amazing thing to, to see in, 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 in that moment in history, you know, these two boys just ha having this recognition of one, one another, you know, despite the mm. historical backdrop. It's just amazing that, you know, that the power of human connection can just go, go beyond whatever historical or racial or cultural differences, you know, when, when, when two people really see each other, it can, it can last a lifetime. There was actually a ceremony in which your dad was declared a real Zulu. Jaron, just unpack that trip to KZN for us. Yeah, that was a profound journey for my dad, the first time he went to Zululand. It's, uh, you know, when we, whenever my dad would speak to us, he would always give us an idea that you know it was kind of hard to get to Zululand, um, but we never really realized that you know the 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 motions that you'd have to go through. You know, Sipo getting hustling to get him a ticket on a on a black only bus, and you know how perplexed the bus driver would be. You know, like why is this kid here? Um, but it it was a profound journey uh, and moment for my dad to you know to realize that he was fully embraced by. Sipo and was you know inducted into his clan and it charged my dad with uh, a welcoming kind of energy to further understand and 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 dive deeper into the Zulu culture I mean it is a it's a it's a wild story I mean you know the police showed up uh, <laughs> he really had to you know the, the, there was a lot of explaining to be done but it is a uh, you know he, he he got out of a lot of those situations just showing his, his profound and deep uh, understanding and respect for the culture um, and also you know I think it's it's it shows how musically it, he was able to to make that 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 crossing you know because it started with music just with a, a pure musical connection with Sipo and uh, it ended up you know allowing him to really further uh, dive in into into the culture. So yeah, it is. It's a it's a wonderful story, and I would suggest everybody go to Zululand. You know, go to go around that Tugela River Valley, and you'll see for yourself uh, how absolutely spectacular and beautiful it is, and how it is a it's a doorway into this uh, other world. You know. Your father disputes the assumption that politics was the motivation behind the formation of Juluka, and rather he says that Juluka was a concept. What did he mean by a concept? I think similarly to the first time he met Charlie, you know, there was this love of the music. And, um, you know, my dad initially was learning 
Spanish guitar and classical guitar and he always had a love for Irish folk music and you know his mom was a jazz singer so he had a lot of Western musical influences in his life he was in that world but when he found Zulu culture and when uh, Zulu music and and he heard it for the first time he was completely blown away and it's a completely unique style globally in terms of guitar playing it's absolutely incredible i mean they reach in the guitar the finger picking style is completely unique to zulu guitar like maskanda guitar is is one of the most unique guitar playing styles in the world and i think that when sipo and and my dad started writing music together you know beyond just playing traditional uh zulu music they actually started to write music i think that they realized that they had this incredible creative chemistry and so it was an experiment Jaluka was a, it it was an experiment to try and find a way to express Zulu maskanda music in a new format to try and mix and match different styles and concepts and genres and and find a way to get them to talk to each other in a in a new and un- unique way and i think it was very exciting it was very cutting edge no one else was doing it i think they both realized that they had stumbled across something that was completely unique to this band and to this moment and so it was really um again not a political thing it was it was a celebration of self expression it was a, a celebration of finding a way for cultures to talk to each other and connect with each other and expressing you know south african life through this mixed cultural um you know form so uh, yeah i think i think that again the politics found them and they had to deal with all kinds of obstacles along the way which he writes about um but i think that the reason that they were so motivated and the reason that they, they could fight through all those things is because they it started from the art it started from a creative place a, a, a celebration of self expression more than anything and they they truly believed in it so it was something that they could fight for in the books forward by Johnny's manager Rodney Quinn he tells how your dad always brought back something for the both of you after touring and Jaren he specifically recalls dinosaur toys for you um is that how you remember your childhood when your father was away because Rodney Quinn gives the impression that the family was constantly on your dad's mind when he was away absolutely my dad was amazing in how he compartmentalized his career I mean it's hugely compartmentalized and his family was this priority and at the end of the day you know you go out uh, everyone has their own idea but you know for my dad it was he's going out on tour he's really connecting with people he's having a great time and at the end of the day he's doing it because he wants to you know he wants to take care of his family and he wants an amazing life for his family and he made it incredibly clear to us that that we were his priority because as much as he we could he would he would bring us on tour and we he he always he always was open and vulnerable with us uh, about that saying you know when when we were somewhere in an some ungodly location you know like wherever eastern europe or something you know we'd be having a we'd be having a happy moment and he'd say i'm i love my family you know he would he would say it to us and he would always make it clear that that was the, at the end of the day that's that was what he loved and and yeah he would uh spoil us with lots of uh with uh, lots of toys that he found on his way so he'd always be thinking of us you know that was his way of also saying you know his his favorite thing to do is not like shop for well he loved shopping for jackets and stuff for <laughs> for touring but he loved shopping for us and you know getting us things and thinking of us and it was his way of saying that you know i really missed you guys and this you know a I've spent a lot of my time and uh, my my touring money getting you guys some dinosaur toys. So, yeah. <laughs> Johnny writes that he has never seen himself as a guitarist and there is a story in the book where another guitarist asked him where his effects rack is and he kind of just smiles to himself. Um I think many would be surprised by his statement. So Jesse, could you just tell us why he didn't necessarily see himself as a guitarist? Um I think that, you know, look i mean as a musician myself you know that and and having grown up w- um you know with his idea of music and how he approached music i think that what he loves about music was the ability to tell a story you know the ability to make observations about life to write lyrics and melody over chords and express something that can't be expressed just through poetry or just through 
instrumental music. It's the combination of storytelling and music that combines to make something really special and really express something unique. Um, and you always said that the, the hardest song to write is a simple song um, because it captures something profound in the simplest, most easily digestible way that anyone can relate to immediately, no matter what your background is. And, and there's something that gets lost when, uh, when music becomes too technical or too theoretical. He, he never, he, he, you know, when, when I was starting to get into music, he, he, he kind of discouraged me from learning too much music theory or learning scales or getting too deep into the technical side of music. You know, for, for, for him, he, he, he always encouraged me to, um, to write songs, you know, to, to think about your life and use this as a tool. Because even if you don't become a musician, it's such an amazing tool to be able to express yourself and to, to have a tool to um, communicate who you are. Um, and so I think that, you know, the, the, there are musicians that, that go very deep into the technical side of it. And I think for him, that was not his preference. It wasn't his goal. I think he wanted to tell stories and he knew that um, getting lost in technicality and getting lost in key signatures and time signatures and the theory and all, you know, all the, you know, music can be quite a mathematical um, endeavor when you get deep into it. And there, there's something um, so human about just playing with just, just your ear, you know, playing, playing, playing music based on what you feel and what, what, what your ear wants to hear. You know, it keeps you close to your heart, you know. Um, and I think that that was for him something that, um, that was something that he loved to focus on as a musician. So he was never someone who, who went into the technical, even though actually, as, as he was hard on himself, but he was actually a great guitarist and he was a great mm. singer as well. I mean, he was a really, really brilliant singer. You know, he, over the years, he honed his skills and he was a multi-instrumentalist. So. I think that when he says that he's not a guitarist, I think it's more a comment on his own priorities as an artist rather than his actual proficiency. As much as he says in the book that he wasn't political, your father does write with extreme clarity about the apartheid era and what it was like for the people of color during this time. Um, I mean, as much as this book is his origin story, he wouldn't have become who he was without those people. Just tell us about how he came to accept his identity. Well, his journey and his life is a beautiful story of self-discovery and of finding identity and finding a home. And it is, uh, it is, it is a, a quite a fantastical tale that you know happened to have taken place in this very strange context of apartheid. And I think it would have happened regardless of context. He would have he would have made these deep connections with people and, and made these lifelong friends. And it, it is something something that you, you realize that a lot of people I think don't before reading the book is that at his core he totally adopted the you know these Zulu a lot of these Zulu values and it it totally shaped him at at his core about you know how he dealt with the world how he dealt with challenges how he overcame challenges you know you you wonder where he got his drive from how he had the energy to take on every show where a lot of there was sabotage. People didn't want didn't want this project to succeed, and he speaks about you know he 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 kind of gives you a glimpse of how how migrant Zulu uh, men would position themselves in the in the world use it with their traditional values and their traditional values. Basically, I'm paraphrasing would position them as a problem for the world as opposed to the world being this, this massive problem that you are overcoming, you're the problem. You know, you're, you're the thing the world has to face. A lot of those values are what really gave him this thick skin and allowed him to steal himself in this, in this very chaotic time. And, you know, he was, when, even in his, in his last years of, of battling the, the disease, we really sh saw how his core identity really shown through. He wouldn't be doing the traditional ways of dealing with, with these things. He would fall to his Zulu beliefs and his, and his values of, of, of fighting this challenge. And he would go out and he'd do, uh, you know, something, it's a, a, something called a, a gear, which is a Zulu banishing dance. To, to kind of banish and to reset, you know, your core self 
you know, uh, so when he would be when he had just done chemo, he would go out and he and he'd really see if he could dance still, and that's something that you know made us realize that that this was something profoundly uh, definitive for him in his life, uh, and that that made us realize that was you know he had found his home in in that in a profound way in the Zulu culture and in those values. Lastly, Jesse, the family decided to keep the book as is. It's all Johnny's words. Um, why did the family go that route? I think we just wanted to honor his voice and honor the story that he wanted to tell. Uh, we didn't want anyone speaking for him. Um, and I don't think it was, it, it was not incomplete in terms of what he wanted to say. And, you know, he, he always wanted it to end with the end of Jaluka. You know, this was, it was his early years. That was the concept of the book. Um, so it wasn't incomplete in that sense, in terms of the scope, but I think that he may have wanted to add more or he may have remembered more stuff if he had had another chance to have go, go through the book again. Uh, unfortunately, he ran out of time, um, but he had been working really hard on it for you know, multiple years. And so we wanted to honor the work that he had done. Uh, we thought that it was beautiful and it was a beautiful document to, to celebrate uh, firstly, his life, and just memorialize it, and also it's just an amazing, um, it's an amazing vision of South Africa. It's a, it's a, it's a history of South Africa in such a specific time and moment and place in history, from his perspective, which is also so unique, uh, and the experiences that he was having in 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 that context were just so beautiful and profound. Um, you know, we just felt like we um, we wanted to honor. What he, the work that he had put in by, by sharing it with everyone. And I think that, um, you know, the response has just been so amazing. We, we, feel, um, we feel huge gratitude that everyone, you know, read it and, and had this beautiful connection to it. So, um, you know, it's always difficult when someone passes away and they leave work behind and you don't know, you know, what, what the intention should be. But, you know, he, we know that he wrote it with the intention of releasing it. He worked really hard on it. He finished it in the sense of he wanted it to begin in one place and end in another place. And the only thing that we really felt strongly about was that no one should speak for him. No one should try and write in his voice. No one should, um, no one should alter the text. We just wanted to preserve what was there. Um, and yeah, I think I think he. I mean, he's he's an amazing writer. I, you know, always we all joke as a family that you know if he had more time, he probably could have had a career as a, a awesome. novelist yeah. after his music. You know, yeah. <laughs> that was Jesse and Jaron Clegg discussing Johnny Clegg's memoir, Scattling of Africa.